Bas. Thank you, Brother Paul. Thank you for that uh, introduction uh, and those uh, nice words. Uh, it's really a privilege to be here with all of you, uh, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to say a few encouraging things from the Word of God. It's good to see uh, some of you that I haven't seen in a while. I'm trying to look through who's got their camera on, so I can't see all that many familiar faces because most of the cameras are off, but I do see some familiar names, and so it's good to be uh, with you this evening over Zoom. This is a first for me. I've not done a, a sermon over Zoom before, so do forgive me uh, if there are any technical issues, but um, I think we should be okay. Um, again, thank you to the leadership for uh, this opportunity. And um, yeah, without further ado, I will get into the lesson for this evening. Uh, I'm going to read the scripture reading again. And if you have your Bibles uh, with you, please turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. And we'll start reading at verse 14. Revelation, chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. It says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I should have called the lesson, The Sin of being lukewarm. That's actually what I de want to deal with uh, this evening, the sin of lukewarm, because we must understand as children of God that the state of being lukewarm is clearly a sin. The Lord is clearly displeased with those who are, in fact, lukewarm. He says in very vivid language, he will spew those that he finds to be lukewarm out of his mouth. Another version would say, uh, to vomit. Have you sat at the dinner table before with guests and have someone vomit at the table? This is very direct, uh, thought-provoking and vivid language that the Lord is using. You see, the danger for us is that it's easy to see when one is cold or when one is hot. But it's very difficult sometimes to know when we are lukewarm. And this is uh, one of the biggest dangers about being in this state. I'm fully convinced that this sin of being lukewarm is one of the biggest challenges facing the church today. If you have the opportunity and if you've been in the church long enough, you would, you would know that churches all over are becoming smaller and smaller. Attendance is not what it used to be, especially because of uh, things like Zoom and other platforms that people can stream and record. Uh, attendance is not what it always should be. There's less evangelism programs happening at most places. Uh, even after COVID, many have not gotten back to uh, what it used to be. Less gospel campaigns, less door knocking, overall less evangelism. Also, another shocking thing, if you've uh, had the opportunity to be with other Christians in other places is the biblical ignorance in some places that you find amongst brethren. We must understand that our Christian faith, brethren, is a serious matter. We are not here to play games. Too many in the church today see the church as, uh, I want to say, as a retirement as some kind of cruise ship, when in fact it's more like a warship, because we must realize that we are in fact in a spiritual war. If you have your Bibles again, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'll start reading at verse 5. Excuse me, uh, I'll start reading. At verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 3, Paul writes and he says this, For though we walk in the flesh, 
we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that, exalt, that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We must realize that we are in a spiritual war. What would happen to an army going through a war, not, realize what, not realizing what they were doing? Do you know that the biggest advantage you can get in a war is having the element of surprise? We cannot go through life not realizing that we are in this war. Another thing that we have to realize is we, as brothers and sisters, as children of God, as the church of God, have a responsibility. We have God-given uh, God responsibilities that we need to fulfill. You see, the three main functions of the church are this. Number one, evangelism, the preaching of the gospel. The mission of the church is to convert the world. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19 and verse 10. Our mission, likewise, before Jesus went to prepare a place for us in heaven, he said in Mark 16, verses 15 to 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That's our responsibility, brethren. Number two, edification. Edifying one another spiritually, building ourselves up. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26, Paul dies to them and he says, What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. We need to build one another up. And that's why we need to realize the dangers of not being there when the church assembles. We are losing out. You are losing out because someone else can't build you up. Someone else is losing up when you are not there because you are not building them up. That's our God-given responsibility. Number three, benevolence. Taking care of our own needy and the needy of the church. James wrote in James 1.27, he says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now my question is this, brothers and sisters, how can we fulfill those obligations, fulfill the duty of the church, if we are all lukewarm, if we are not on fire for Jesus, and this is why the job is not getting done many times. And we need to ask ourselves some hard questions. Are we lukewarm today? You and I, I include myself in this question because self-evaluation is important. But here are some questions that you and I can ask ourselves every now and then to answer and figure out if we in fact are lukewarm today. Has your love for Jesus and the church grown cold? Only you can answer this. Do you attend all services faithfully as you should? Or do we come up with excuses for why we can't attend or why it's too difficult, it's raining, it's cold, the weather's not nice? Are we still passionate about the church and its work? Or has it become a burden for you and I? And here's a big one. Do we still speak to others, speak to strangers about the Lord? Can others, and this is also a big one, can others tell that you are a Christian by the way that you live? Or would they be shocked to find out that uh, you are in fact a Christian, your friends, your colleagues, your neighbors? Do you give like you should of your means and of yourself? Do you love the brethren? Are you able to tolerate sin in and around you and it doesn't bother you anymore? Because that's what being a lukewarm Christian will do to you. A question we can ask ourselves, brethren, is what would the church be like if everyone were like you? If everyone gave like you gave, if everyone studied the Bible like you studied, if everyone attended like you attend, what would the church be like? Would it be better or worse off? That's something each of us need to deal with. What are some of the reasons that we find ourselves in this lukewarm state? 
a love for this world, number one, and the things of the world, work, money, hobbies, entertainment, a big one. Many sat last night and watched the rugby game, uh, the Springboks playing. Didn't get up this morning to attend service. John writes in 1 John 2, from verses 15 to 17, Love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes the way, and the love thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We need to understand, brethren, that we cannot have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It doesn't work that way. No man, the Lord said, can serve two masters. You'll love the one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and money. In Matthew 6 and verse 33, we know this verse well. Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. How much do you love the world? Are you one of those Christians that have one foot in the world and one foot in the church? You're going to find it difficult to get out of the state of being lukewarm. The second uh, thing I want to point out is a lack of true faith, a lack of true biblical faith. In Hebrews 11 and verse 6, the Hebrew writer says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If we understand that we are serving the creator of the universe, almighty God, then I'm convinced that we won't act the way we do, that we won't neglect our duties the way we do. How can we say that we believe in God almighty, and then we won't do what he requires of us to do? Remember, James tells us that faith without works being alone, is dead, is dead. And so we can't just claim to be Christians, we can't just claim to be warm, but we've got to show it in the things that we do. The third reason for being lukewarm, I believe, is lack of knowledge. Biblical knowledge, actually, let me say, lack of biblical knowledge. Hosea 4 and verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest unto me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. We know that when it comes to faith and knowledge, they go, into, they go hand in hand. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If we want to increase our faith, we have to increase our knowledge. We have to study uh, uh, like <clears throat> excuse me, like Paul would encourage Timothy, the young evangelist, to study in 2 Timothy 2 and verse, 10, uh, verse 15, where he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we have many today that can't rightly divide the word of truth. If we want to grow in our faith, brethren, we must study like God wants us to study. You see, we don't have a choice, really. If we get to that day and that final judgment and find that we are in a state of lukewarm, it will be too late. There will be uh, no coming back from that. Each of us are going to give an account for what we've done. And you know what the saddest thing about being lukewarm is? We go through life not knowing that we are in this state. I think one of the saddest passages in all of the Bible, is found in Matthew chapter 7, from verses 21 to 23. Turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Matthew chapter 7. And we'll read from verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? 
Verse 23 says, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. How many of us are going through the motions? Abiding by traditions. Coming on a Sunday morning, we get there, we sing our five songs, and it's really just become a routine. And we need to be careful and examine ourselves, as Paul would encourage us to see whether we are in the faith. Because if we are just going through the motions, we know that Jesus is displeased with that because he rebuked the Pharisees for that kind of behavior in Matthew 15. Is that you and I? We don't have a choice, brothers and sisters. Being in the lukewarm state is displeasing to God. And we need to change that. You see, back in Revelation chapter 3, that we started out with, in verse 19, Jesus goes on to say this. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. We can repent of this being in this state of being lukewarm. It's having a change of mind. We can choose to be zealous, enthusiastic, passionate, energetic again about the Word of God, about our faith. You know, often when uh, you ask some Christians, how's it going with you? And uh, they go, I'm fine. You know, I'm just surviving. That's not the life of a Christian. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The Christian life is a better life. We can be zealous about it. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul as he writes to uh, Titus. When he says in Titus chapter 2, from verses 11 to 14, he says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, Zealous of good works. A peculiar people is a people that stands out from the world, not one that blends in. That's why uh, Paul died to the Romans in Romans chapter 12, where he says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed, just uh, the exact opposite. Purify unto himself a peculiar people. Zealous, excited about, enthusiastic about. Good works. You see, my friends, if you are in a state of uh, being lukewarm, you can decide today to change. You can repent of that state and decide today that you are again going to be zealous, just like you were when you came up out of those waters of baptism. Many of us remember that feeling of being a new Christian, of wanting to share that joy and that hope with someone else. We need to get back there. And that's how we'll grow again. That's how the church will fulfill its obligations. That's how we'll fill our buildings again. And if you are listening, uh, I don't know all of you, but there may be some that are not uh, Christians, that are not yet a child of God. I want to encourage you today that you decide today and not leave it till tomorrow that you want this more abundant life. That only Jesus can offer you. This world is difficult. This world has issues. And the Christian life I tell uh, everyone. But especially uh, younger people. When I speak to them and uh, deal with the youth. The Christian life is a better life. We're all going to go through struggles. Christians, non-Christians alike. But those of us that are in Christ. Have the Lord with us on our side. Jesus said. I will never leave you. Nor forsake you. And that's my encouragement for all of us today. We can be confident that we have Jesus on our side. And we don't have to be lukewarm. We can be zealous. We can be enthusiastic. We can be warm on fire for the Lord again. Thank you so much, brethren, uh, for your attention.